the very first The Legend of Zelda game is a monumental video game classic. Or, well, people like to say it is. But it doesn't always seem to be fully apparent how or why that is. Apart from it, of course, being the original. The catalyst for other games that I guess are just more interesting to talk about. And don't get us wrong, we actually love this game. It's a fun old time. But it's pressing how common it is to see players somewhat discard it as a bit too primitive and archaic for modern tastes. A game with cool ideas bogged down by janky combat, repetitive levels and an overall clueless conveyance of just bombing every wall and burning every bush until you finally find something of note. To even understand half of the stuff in it, you probably needed a Nintendo Power subscription. Or at worst, you might have even had to look through the manual. On that note, we actually managed to buy a copy this time. Let's take a look. Spielelein What the hell is that? Oh, it's in German. That's why we could afford it. It's essentially a landmark game in terms of legacy more than anything else. In many regards, Zelda spelled its own demise by being so darn influential. I think very few people today compare it with contemporaries like Dragon Slayer or Hydelight to get a good picture of its original appeal. Instead, the most obvious route would seemingly be to just compare this game with other Zeldas. And in that race, it is just doomed. No contest. It is a game that people are more familiar with as a piece of history, rather than as genuine entertainment. Of course, there are some salvageable parts in there that are still somewhat unique to it. For example, there's certainly some merit to how it just plopped you into a world to fend for yourself, in a system that respected the player's capability with some toughest nails challenges. In that way, the first Zelda distinguishes itself from later iterations that are very keen to hold the player's hand by ceaselessly spouting exposition, constantly giving hints and making sure the hardest part is seeing the game over screen. This contrast has on few occasions helped model other games to embrace a structure of open-endedness and heightened challenge through a rather off-hands approach most famously in the series overhaul Breath of the Wild, but also through other titles like the aesthetic bit callback 3D Dot Game Heroes, the free-roaming nightmare world Elden Ring, and now the current best game of the year, Tunic. The inspirations from the first Zelda are obvious in Tunic. The whole presentation with the little fox boy carrying a sword and cross-laden shield is a dead giveaway. Just the name Tunic in itself is a word exclusively found in fashion magazines and Zelda discussions. This carries over into the mechanics. Most of the game is spent walking around a top-down overworld waving your sword at bad guys, where new paths are opened by discovering some cool treasure. You found a sword? Now you can chop down bushes. You found a lantern? Now you can see in the dark. Is this a metroidvania? Is Zelda a metroidvania? Hey Kiki, is Zelda a metroidvania? Of course it is, what else would it be? The second obvious inspiration are From Software's Souls games, where combat is heavy and deliberate, in a balance that puts more importance on reading and evading the enemies than how to attack them. On surface level, Tunic is essentially an indie recreation of the Zeldas of old, with a focus on difficulty while refreshing its other elements. Which isn't exactly new or novel. And if that was the only notable part about it, then it would probably be a bit unremarkable and predictable. However, there is another dimension to Tunic. The pervasive, mysterious tone makes the ambient, bloom-filled world come across as feverish instead of summery. Much like the bleak surroundings of the original Hyrule, there is an uncertainty to Tunic's barren ruins that makes you unsure if this place is ancient or if the dust has just settled. 
discovery feels less deliberate and more incidental, with key items scattered or sometimes stolen by other actors equally inhabiting the virtual space. From the moment you wake up on the beach, information is garbled by an incomprehensible unknown language, where only vague keywords carry through the communicative noise. Tunic feels intently not made for you. As the player, you're a stranger in a foreign land traversing a game world that is essentially used. Someone just left a lantern here, another one lost their shield in a battle, giving you the sense that this is an adventure already experienced. This idea of Tunic as a previously played game is primarily conveyed through the in-game manual, which is presented by torn out pages discovered on your travels. The design work carries the look and feel of luxuriously elaborate old-school manuals, made authentic with high-fidelity print artifacts, complete with tears, creases and scribbles left by some past unknown player. You can almost smell it. <laughs> Doubtless, this approximation is not just for the sake of looking neat, but to effectively evoke the traditional role of instruction booklets in our play sessions. Peering into the manual pauses the game in a conventional way, but it's presented by adding an extra layer of recursion between game and player, as a pixelated CRT iteration of Tunic is left frozen in the background, while the manual, in its naturalistic virtual physicality, takes immediate presence. The fact that this game draws from classics like the original Legend of Zelda is again noticeable through the design of the manual, with especially the front cover clearly paraphrasing its inspiration. But perhaps what's not as immediately apparent with this added layer of fiction is how it presents the manual, the paratext, as text, something inherently part of the game despite to some extent existing beyond it. This is actually quite interesting, because by this, Tunic effectively highlights video game manuals as a concept and treats them as a form of language, simultaneously making the case that they are indeed essential parts of their games, that they are part of the actual text. It is basically just a virtual book, no different to any other codex log so common within the medium. But by invoking the design sensibilities of game manuals in particular, Tunic successfully reminds us of the fact that it is indeed a game, but also that this is a part of it. Really, we need only see a single sheet from this booklet to immediately identify it as a game manual, and by that surmise what it contains, what it says, and possibly even in what order. This helps with efficiently upping the stakes of its importance. Starting out, the pages will seem like little more than a neat method of presenting a non-intrusive tutorial, but quickly they become quite valuable helpful crutches by containing things like maps or item lists. Heck, you might even find some story in there. Is this lore? At a certain point, however, the manual makes an incredibly impressive leap by touching upon two key factors that revolve around the use of manuals rather than their design. Let's call them obstruction and inheritance. Firstly, the obstruction part is where Tunic's reliance on its manual is made so firm that the act of finding a specific page could reveal crucial information that open new paths and even radically alter how the game is played. Additionally, the arcane language hampers our understanding of what's being conveyed. It's a bit like having a German Zelda manual. You're not getting access to everything that's in here i.e. because you didn't have the full manual, you didn't know how the game was played. Secondly, inheritance is through the notes left by an unknown past user who also played Tunic at some point, revealing increasingly life-saving hints that unintentionally help the player through indirect means. That is, because someone else played this game before you, their notes for figuring things out act as clues for you. Evidently, these aspects have been fabricated, they are fictitious and designed to reveal information to the player at the right pace or highlight specific parts of interest by distinguished emphasis. However, what this also means is that Tunic's view of manuals as an inherent part of games equally encompasses the 
absence of context and additional context, obstruction and inheritance. A common part of buying a used game are the jotted down notes by past owners, or conversely, the complete lack of a manual. These are somewhat involuntary factors of playing video games that still become part of our experiences. It shows how the manual may significantly alter one's understanding of a game like, say, Zelda, especially in a pre-internet past as suggested by Tunic's presentation. What this all means for how Tunic in particular uses its manual is that it equally stresses the importance of them for video games, while simultaneously admitting that they are in some sense non-essential. Pausing the game to look at the pages is just that, leaving the game to carry that play somewhere else. You are most definitely still playing Tunic to some extent, but it's not by pressing buttons to perform in-game tasks. It's still cohesive, but the fox boy with the sword part is paused. There is nothing mechanically happening within the manual that affects the game itself apart from, I guess, being a form of collection within Tunic in particular. This is highly reminiscent of video games of old, but it would seem that our way of engaging with games has changed so much that this being part of them is not immediately obvious. Today, manuals are probably seen as extraneous more than anything. Things that shouldn't need to be there because you can theoretically play the entire game without it. With time, that became the norm, and that is presumably part of the reason why Tunic presents its manual within the game software itself. The manual is part of the game. The manual is essential for playing the game. But technically, You'll never have to open it once if you've learned all of the ins and outs. What that is to say is that everything this manual gives you, and by golly does it give you some cool stuff, is only through information. Some of these pages could practically be regarded as power-ups with how much they further open up the game, but that is through knowledge learned. And in that regard, it's something you not only can carry into subsequent playthroughs, but in some sense, involuntarily will. In practice, you can truly only play through Tunic once, before your gained knowledge of it transforms it into a new game that seems familiar, but is fundamentally altered. This form of design uniquely places Tunic within a small group of games that all equally focus on a design structure where information about the game itself and how it is played are to some extent obscured, which has to be discovered and subsequently learned. The three most prominent examples here are the 2012 Dimension Warping Fez, the 2016 Pattern Recognition Overload The Witness, and now the 2022 Fox Boy Toy Box Tunic. While superficially existing in completely different conventional genres, we'd argue that those are merely vessels for conveying the larger ideas of game design at play here. Fez isn't really all about jumping, and The Witness isn't really just about drawing lines. They are games about discovery. The means is exploration, but the substance is learning. In this comparison, Tunic sheds its exterior as a Souls-like Zelda clone and instead becomes something much the same. These games are conceptual kin, they are united not by their main game loops, but by player engagement. Let's give them a silly sounding name for the sake of it. Like Knowledgeborns or Riddle-likes. Or wait, no, Brainvanias. That's ridiculous. Brilliantly awful. There's no way this one doesn't stick. I guess Outer Wilds can hang with them as well for good measure. Anyway, in our first Brainvania game, Fess. The player travels through a desolate pixel universe collecting golden cubes, but prominent features in the level geometry perplexed players with their obscurity. Within the door at the end waited a revelation that only half of the game had been completed, with the rest found by slowly untangling the scattered clues left about. It became a game about perception, about how we slowly learn to see and notice more. 
but the vessel of a self-aware meta video game also suggested that Fez was equally about how we view games. The sudden genre shift meant that playing Fez stopped being about platform jumps and more about cryptography scribbles in notepads, as the obsessive drive towards knowledge and the truth led to more questions than answers. It's a transcendent game that values and rewards the player through process rather than results. The exhilaration of solving its mysteries are more fun than what those mysteries ultimately hold, and at its final moments, Fez makes this clear to the players by giving them the benefit of never being fully done, to keep questioning and wondering. In much the same way, The Witness is a game that is all about repeated processes. The simplicity of what that game does more than anything else is an escalation of its scope. From moment one, you have been exposed to essentially everything you will ever do in this game mechanically, drawing lines. But working out the specific rules for how this line drawing actually functions is up to discovery. You will find this out by exploring the world and stumbling upon nondescript tutorials for every aspect of the game. How knowledge is learned is heavily associated with those environments, so even if you don't exactly remember all the rules, simply inhabiting that space will more likely than not jog your memory of how you found things out. The Witness expertly exemplifies this to the player by having its conclusion revolve around that learned knowledge and how it never truly goes away, that the core challenge of the game was always about learning the rules rather than finishing the puzzles. Tunic equally makes the same point as Fess and the Witness, knowledge is power and what you learn stays with you. By that merit, your second playthrough will look vastly different from the first, because you already took the journey of discovery and found the secrets of the world. Secrets that had immediate application within the game, in ways that were always present. The only true distinctions here are the medium and the ultimate point. Despite being so similar in concept, these games all use different channels to convey distinct ideas. Fess uses genre subversion and the meta puzzles to question its boundaries, while The Witness uses escalation of knowledge to comment on the joys and metamorphosis of learning. In that sense, Tunic's vessel is its manual, and we'd argue that the ultimate point is to highlight the relationship between games and their paratext. As a full package, it's a game probably spent more staring at the manual pages instead of hitting pigs with your sword, but once that threshold is passed, once you're no longer reliant on the instruction booklet, Tunic once again reverts to a game about hitting pigs with your sword, just a lot more efficient and bespoke this time. Applying your newfound knowledge is fun and makes the game a lot more versatile from the start, but the puzzle is solved. The mystery is gone. Almost bittersweet. There is a sense of excitement about learning in Tunic, present every time you find another sheet of paper. Every new page could potentially flip the game on its head simply through the act of uncovering more of the proverbial Tunic iceberg. At first, it's simple things like figuring out you can even run, to revelations that make you see the world with new eyes. But what's perhaps also happening here, from a cultural perspective, is a commentary on the game's source. Because at the end of the day, we suspect that Tunic isn't really just about Tunic, and we also know that this video isn't actually just about Tunic either. It's about the very first Legend of Zelda. A game consumed by the march of time, undone by its later offspring, with an unbearable mountain of context weighing it down. A game no one with dignity dares to hate, but likewise, not a game many people have the gall to love. But you know what? We actually quite like it. In fact, it's the best Zelda game. And I know some of you will get pissy about that statement, so here it is again. It's the best Zelda game. It's the best Zelda game. It is the best Zelda What strikes us about this first iteration of Zelda is primarily a raw sincerity. 
As previously stated, plopping the player into the world is a delightfully crass way of being succinct and honest. The freeform structure allows experienced players to tackle dungeons out of order and potentially find useful items way before they're meant to. Really, the only thing holding you back are the raft and the ladder, which segment the progression around the halfway point. The challenge is absolutely palpable in more ways than one, and there is no shortage of moments that will keep your blood pumping. But that's also a method of upping stakes and making your journeys of discovery not just treacherous, but primarily exciting. The juxtaposition between overworld and underworld especially fuels the tension of this game. Entering this realm switches the atmosphere to a dreary mood, with new unseen monsters working in strange ways. Until you're at the precipice, standing in the room before the boss monster and hearing its muffled bit screams from beyond the wall. That's amazing. <laughs> What Tunic suddenly adds to the mix is admiration for not only these aspects, but the sense of wonder and mystery as both conveyed and mitigated by Zelda's paratext. Because as obtuse and unplayable as that game was, it always carried everything you needed within its original presentation. It's just that this aspect has been completely lost or even belittled over the years. The notion that Zelda is a lesser game because you need to consult its manual is a silly idea when you really consider it. Because as Tunic suggests, isn't that also part of the text? Aren't the tips, clues, clarifications and context provided there meant to be seen and internalized by the player? The opening exposition crawl even tells you to consult it. Hey, it's even on the front cover. Mit Karten von unschätzbarem Wert und strategisch wichtigen Hinweisen. And somehow people still missed it. Can you believe it? Actually, looking at the manual, it's striking how lenient it is with the player. It's understanding of your confusion and very helpful with getting you on track with numerous inclinations for what can be discovered within the game, without fully spelling everything out. There are vague suggestions, leading questions and incomplete maps in here to get you started and incentivize your own discovery. Because the manual also understands the joys of that discovery and learning, as it states. Be patient. Use your learned skills and knowledge. It even says. You should only use the map and strategic tips as a last resort. If you believe in yourself and your inner strength, you will conquer Ganon and return peace to the land of Hyrule. With this in mind, the way The Legend of Zelda creates a balance of both guiding the player and having confidence in their ability, extends the scope of the game and adds an often missed dimension to its more arcane qualities. There's a reason a line like, it's a secret to everybody became iconic. Not because it's a bit funny that this little mobling guy is secretly rooting for Link, but because it perfectly encapsulates that idea of discovery. The relationship between game and manual makes it clear how even the most specific aspects were always plausibly available to you. Things like boss weak points and hidden dungeons are absolutely inferred here, and that makes things like the final Ganon confrontation not a battle as much as a riddle. This exemplifies how there is an extra skill set asked by the game's difficulty that is essentially removed when the manual is absent. But perhaps more importantly, when knowledge is learned. Because let's not trick ourselves, some of the most arcane things in here aren't actually that obscure anymore. They have rather been made infamous by decades of discussion that firmly engraves them into your mind. The cultural exchange somewhat makes the manual redundant to an audience that, let's face it, aren't nerdy enough to actually attempt to beat this game. But even then, this is something enforced within the very game itself. It doesn't just end with goodbye, but incitement to have another go with the second quest, to employ the learned knowledge and take on a new adventure that's challenging in other ways. At a certain point, the Legend of Zelda expects you to put down the manual and work on your own, much like Tunic does with its recurrent playthroughs. The demystification of their worlds transforms both of them in much the same way, it's just that one is a lot more blatant about this than the other. 
From that angle, what Tunic does with its in-game manual acts both as a love letter to and argument about the physical Zelda one. Tunic literally dresses itself up as a Zelda game, identifies the manual as the most magical and important part about that game, and then employs modern design to make a virtual approximation of it that is presented in an appealing way. This unique approach to meta-commentary not only emphasizes the strengths of its predecessor, but actively enhances it by framing it in a way that makes its charm, allure and mystery immediately apparent. Playing Tunic, you're practically forced, maybe even kicking and screaming, to admit a core singular truth. Manuals are cool. And Zelda extending itself through it was never a bad thing. It was just a commonality of its time that got lost whenever the game was ported or emulated, because the paratext is rarely treated with the same care as loose cards. When playing old games naked, we are in some sense no better than the foolish kids who threw the boxes and pamphlets in the trash. We are discarding something very valuable, and sometimes essential to the experience here. Manuals are by their nature a product of a bygone era, when technological limitations meant that some crucial information had to be stored outside the game. As time marched forward, their role became less and less obvious. Truthfully, it was one of the first costs publishers seemed to skimp down on. As gorgeous full-color booklets gave way to monochrome leaflets with little more than controls and legal information, manuals lost their charm until they finally disappeared altogether. The irony of Tunic's reliance and emphasis of its manual is that in the most traditional sense, it is not actually a manual. It is a gamified approximation of one, tied to a completion rate in what is for now a digital-only download game. This manual, despite how real it seems, is not a manual, and doesn't function with the immediacy that manuals probably should. But in every other sense of the word, it absolutely is one. It might even be the best one. The funny part is that since their disappearance, manuals in themselves have been made a form of luxury, included as a novelty in special editions of modern games to recall a past of more elaborate presentations. Not made to help players as much as provide an alternate past for hardcore fans. Maybe they'll even release a physical copy of Tunic down the line with an actual manual in there. It feels like a given like the most obvious game to ever receive a proper physical release. But at the same time, that will likely take away the point and detract from how the game would be received by a potential first-time player. At the utmost regard, Tunic can ideologically never have an actual manual, because it would detract not just from how it is played, but by what it conveys. Because more than anything else, through heavy reliance and mystique, Tunic accomplishes the goal of making the manual invaluable by not taking it for granted, showcasing the complexity in meaningfully bringing such a concept back to the present and punctuating how its place has truly been lost in gaming culture. Thanks for watching the video. There will be an additional spoiler thing at the very end. But before that, we'd like to thank our patrons, who are Supercharge, CEO of 9Volt, All Purpose Nobody, Afayette, Ben Clark, Bibi the Bitch, Cult of the Hyena, Dave Pickett, Ember, Emrasa, Fran Rogers, Gage McColgan, Intungen, Ewell Nilsson, Kitty Kong Facts, Klaus Morals, Matthias Graman, MeowMix64, Mary Mello, Mr. Tellius, Mostling, Nate Kiernan, Nischtschwert, TB Skyen, Vox, Abigail Nail, Ice, Amanda Rönn Idenge, Andreas, Anonymous, Eric Parkinson, Ava Janet, Billy Moran, Botch Frivari, Charles Goldhaber, Chloe, Chloe Strange, Cody Sis, Dr. Pontgusher Esquire, <laughs> Eliza Tantiva, Ephemeral Mist, Erin Olivia, Ferris Feline, Fluff Quist, Gapface, Henrik, Il Caesar, Indigo Trans, 
Infernal Ramblings, Jay Mission, Catherine Jibes, Kiki Sylvie, Kiropsi, Linen, Marika, Mar B, Max Miller, Mike Nigrelli, Mitch Haley, Nathan Schaff, Pink Ostrich, Rival Magma, Saxon, Scott from Nursing, Shogun, Silly Rookie, Skyhoppers, Sleepy Slug, S Marina, Suitcase, Surashu, Sweet Pink, Silva Rigota, The Queer Birdman, <laughs> Tobias Matson, VG, and Vexelbun. Also introducing Aram Kellogg's, Lady Starlight, Lake, Mako Cabot, and Matt MML Lucas. If you also decide to support us, you'll join this list as well as getting access to our Discord server. And of course, you also get the audio companions where we talk more in depth about the videos and their production. Anyway, here's the spoiler thing. So if you haven't played Tunic yet, you should probably duck out right now. Oh lord, it's coming! So, you know the whole thing with the door in the mountain and the golden path? That was so gosh darn cool. Having to piece together the patterns within the pages, like, it just extends the scope of how intricate and well planned this manual actually is. The hidden save file that leads to the secret room? I love it. Also, it's really cute how you hand over the finished manual to your mom or whatever. Just overall wholesome. Leaves you with a good feeling, you know. Tunic is like our new favorite game. You could even say that it's coincidentally the best game ever made. So is the first Zelda, by the way. <laughs> Kiki just forgot to write that in the script, so now you know. Put that on the list, uh, on the wiki, whenever that's done, you know. The transparency lore wiki. <laughs> <laughs>